thank you very much to all the school organizers for an opportunity to speak here. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to advertise this beautiful method, uh, which I know for quite a while. And I, it's somewhat unfortunate uh, that it's not, it's not very popular. Uh, so it's deserved to be much more known. And that's uh, one of the goals of my talk today is to, uh, to introduce the methods and hopefully uh, its methods will find its uh, more users and more researchers and more practical users of, of the method. So as it follows from the title, it's all about abstract state machines. And uh, now I would outline shortly what, what will be in this talk. So first I will introduce the methods with kind of small, uh, short historical remarks. Then I will present some source of information. It's by no means comprehensive, but it's just, uh, which would give a good introductory points to the whole method. Then I will go in the details uh, in some uh, introduce basic abstract state machines and then more advanced distributed machines and then discuss its applications in uh, software development uh, specifically. Then I will mention some implementations and I will conclude by a short report on the developments in the University of Liverpool. It's not very extensive, but it would provide some, some points, some illustration points or case studies uh, to, to, to understand better what one can do with the method. Right, uh, very short outline. So what are the abstract state machines? So that is a formalism which was introduced by uh, Yuri Gurevich, a, a, a quite famous mathematician, logician, and computer scientist in late 80s and early 90s of, of previous century. And uh, the idea was uh, to have a versatile formal method, which would have, I would say, exact semantics or precise semantics, at the same time be able to capture computational systems generally, all varieties of computational systems at the right level of abstraction. So, uh, so if we look back what, are, what were formal methods first introduced, so usually in formal methods you have, or formal methods, probably it's not correct word, I would say formal models of computations, usually they have fixed level of abstraction. For example, starting with classical Turing machines, they have something uh, quite rudimentary data structure uh, underneath. So if you would like to model something much more um, advanced, for example, some complicated software on, on this machine. So there is an unnecessary layer of translation involved. Yes, in principle, you can model any computation, but it's unnatural and it's prevents uh, good analysis and good development of such uh, uh, computations and such, such, um, uh, such programs and such software. So the idea was, can we bring together a high level perspective on the computations and underlying formal models? And that was, uh, uh, that was a proposal. And originally it was called evolving algebras as it was introduced in the first paper in end of 80s. But then after a few years and after a few discussions, it was, uh, the term was uh, turned into abstract state machines. So in short, what, what it is. So if you like the whole idea, well, it's just represented in the second item in, in the list you see now on the screen. So this is uh, essentially transition systems which there are some states and there are some tra transitions, a very generic concept in computer science, uh, which, but in this case, the configurations of these systems are representing abstract states. So it's not a states on a fixed level of abstraction like a words or 
uh, I don't know, numbers as a kind of counter machines, but rather abstract states with the idea these states can model uh, almost everything uh, uh, possible and everything thinkable uh, and even unthinkable. Uh, so in mathematical terms, the abstract states are multi-sorted first order structures. Uh, okay, I will, I will return to this point later, what this thing says, but uh, essentially it's uh, uh, arbitrary sets with some relations on them and some functions on them. Uh, well, I, those, those of you who had this uh, logic course recently, oh, you are actually using logic in, in your research or in your in your practice. Uh, of course, we we'll, would we'll, we'll recognize immediately what it is. Uh, but the uh, main underlying idea is, uh, well, specifically, it comes from logic that essentially almost everything we see around, be it in a, outside on the street, or be it uh, in a, our systems we try to program or model, can be modeled or can be faithfully represented by some sets with relations and functions on them. So nothing more than that. But if you take it as a, this abstract concept and you allow arbitrary such structures to serve as a configurations in your model, then you arrive at this concept, abstract state machines. And because you are talking about machines, there are also should be some, some transitions uh, uh, between the states and machines doing something, they transform the states. So uh, uh, these machines also consist some rules, which effectively saying how the states uh, are being updated during the computations. For example, if I model uh, my, for example, machine is operating, my computations are on graphs. And graphs are very simple structures. There are some nodes, there are some edges between nodes. And I start with some initial graph configuration, but then I have some rules, how the nodes, how the edges, for example, updated. Some edges may come into a graph, some edges may, 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 may come off, off the graph uh, and so on. So, uh, so abstract state machines uh, is a kind of general way to formulate the rules, how to update the structures. Not only graphs, it's just a particular uh, instance, but arbitrary structures, uh, which kind of in logical terms are multi-sorted first order structures. Okay, uh, so enough for, for the short introduction, but now uh, uh, just to, it's probably good time to highlight that abstract state machines are both theoretical model. So you can study them like, for example, Turing machines or Kolmogorov machines are such alike models, but they also provide a practical language which allow you to specify different models, uh, uh, different models of computations, different systems, uh, purely computational or even uh, uh, cyber physical systems in which there are some aspects which happens outside of computers, but in some kind of in real life. Uh, so everything, what can be modeled by uh, first order structures uh, can be then be subject uh, of transformations with such kind of machines. And now, uh, nowadays, uh, historically, since 1990s, there was several uh, attempts, uh, uh, several implementations of these machines. Implementations, I mean, some software which support uh, specification and execution uh, of such uh, um, computational model. And uh, uh, I wouldn't review all of them. I, I will just mention two of these machines, uh, two of these implementations, but later on, I, I will come back to implementations and how they can be used, for example, for, uh, for software development. Uh, perhaps, well, it, it's already uh, uh, clear, it should be clear at this point that, uh, we are talking about something formal because I'm referring to logic, I'm referring to mathematical definitions. And it's, it's right, the abstract state machines find their place into, uh, in the broad area of formal methods in system developments. And just let me say a few words why, why, at, all, why at all it does make a sense to apply formal methods. Uh, 
Well, typical scenario in which formal methods are applied, it's at early stages of system development. Even though, just as a side remark, recently it's not necessarily the case with development of software model checker, you apply formal methods even further down the line of, of system developments. But I, I won't touch this uh, uh, today. I, I, I would touch the application of formal methods earlier in a system development cycle. So in this case, you, by using formal models, by creating formal models and studying these formal models, you can detect design faults as early as possible. And ef effectively, you can increase the confidence in the correctness of the system behavior. Now, uh, but what can be achieved by using formal methods? And now you see the list of this, uh, 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 of this simple things which can be achieved. It could be system modeling, and ISM would, would be very good for that. Model simulation. Model simulation, it's also good in terms of, of course, we can, we can create a formal model. You can study it in your head and with a pen and pencil, but uh, uh, somehow it, it may be not very efficient, especially if the model is complicated. It would be good to have a, a ability to simulate a model, to run some program which would actually perform, uh, actually demonstrate the model behavior. But also it can give you opportunity for model validation, at least to make sure that the system you are developing, it satisfies the properties you would like it to have, as well as model verification. And verification in a way, it's a higher degree of, of, of validation when you would like to have a proof, not only some evidence, but also a proof that the model is correct with respect to properties you expect from your model. So, uh, so that is a context in, when, in which abstract state machines come, in, come into play in the system development. And here probably it's time to, to claim the main ASM thesis. And uh, so what, what's the main thesis here? That uh, they were designed, that it was proposed, the formalism uh, basically to make it possible to emulate arbitrary algorithm, I would say more generally arbitrary computations and the natural, in a natural step for step emulation. Uh, what does it mean? Of course, different algorithms or different computations have different, I say granularity of steps, right? So some algorithm uh, that it does make a sense to, to discuss at the level, I don't know, we establish connection with some remote host and then we do some actions and then we close the connection. That is a natural level of discussion if our algorithm operates at this level. On the other hand, you may have algorithms which actually implement a connection, uh, which in itself uh, would be at much lower level of, of granularity uh, much and a different level of abstraction. So the main abstract state machine thesis is Whatever is your algorithm, whatever is your computation, you can always create such a machine which would model it at the natural level of abstraction and step for step. So every transition which is essential from a perspective of your algorithm could be modeled then by appropriate, uh, uh, appropriately created abstract state machine. Of course, it, it would require some tuning, it would require chosen level of abstractions, your basic ingredients, but that's, that's exactly the purpose of, of, of this approach. So it gives you a flexibility how, how to choose it. Now, uh, let me just uh, 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 stop discussion of this uh, uh, for a moment and just to refer to some major sources of information uh, for, for, for this talk which I believe also are very good sources if you would like to start to look at these methods and you would like to, to use it for your own purposes. And by no means this, uh, by no means uh, this is comprehensive uh, uh, list of sources, but well, in my opinion, the most important ones. The first two, it's a, now it's historical, 
uh, historical uh, papers by Yuri Gurevich uh, himself. And as you see, first even called uh, evolving algebra. So before the name was changed to abstract state machines and it's a Lippery guide. And Lippery, uh, it's a beautiful place north to Sicily in Italy. And uh, at the time there was a series of summer school for young computer scientists for different areas of uh, computer science. And I was happy to attend this school in 1993 myself. And I heard it, I feel like from first hands from Yuri Gurevich. Uh, so it just uh, remind me uh, uh, my younger age and uh, how interesting it was and how natural it was. I, I remember vividly my impression first, okay, so it's, it's very natural. So why nobody is doing it right now? That was my first impression from this method. Uh, but nevertheless, so, so this, this is an archive version of the paper and probably one of the best introduction, uh, remains one of the best introduction to the methods because with good motivation, with good examples uh, and so on and so forth. So it's highly recommended. And then you have a second paper from Gurevich. It's a, a, a elaborated draft, 1997. It's also available if, if you Google, uh, you, you can find it. Uh, it's kind of further development of the methods, also very good source of information on the method. And now we jump almost uh, 20 years forward, 20, am I right? Uh, yes, 20, 20 plus. And I would refer to a very recent book on modeling companion for software practitioners by Egan Berger and Alexander Rushke. And this book, uh, I would also highly recommend to see it, uh, development of the methods, very comprehensive presentations of motivation, but also technical part of the method. And uh, as you see it for software practitioners, so it's not overloaded by theoretical details, details but rather giving a lot of interesting examples and uh, generally discuss the place of a method in, in software. Uh, development. Uh, so highly recommended, but also I would mention uh, just uh, on personalities, uh, Yuri Gurevich as the inventor of the method, uh, but Eggenberger is one of the leading uh, 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 people who actually brought it into the practice. So uh, uh, and, and under, under his uh, uh, and, uh, under his leadership, uh, the method was much more, uh, let's say, advertised, developed, a lot of uh, specifications done and so on and so forth. So it's also, uh, if you like, if I would choose two main contributors to the method would be Yuri Gurevich and Egerberger. But of course, there are much more people involved in the research. There are hundreds and hundreds of papers uh, already published and uh, various software made available. So, <clears throat> Uh, well, uh, highly recommended uh, to, to have a look at this. Now, and uh, then yet another source of information on the method is a web page on the University of Michigan, which on the early developments, say from 90s to about 2010, it was a major source of everything related to abstract state machines, uh, papers, software, and so on and so forth. So it's not supported anymore in terms of it's not updated, but it's preserved for historical reference, but it's also very useful to see what already has been done uh, within this method and uh, to, to see uh, different papers, as I said, implementations and so on and so forth. And finally, <clears throat> I would put here, uh, there is a regular conference called ABZ. Uh, uh, about rigorous state-based modeling uh, techniques and this early conference since, if I'm not mistaken, 2010, it, 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 it is going on. And if you look in the proceedings of this conference, you, you, you will be then aware about very recent developments, what's going on in, in, in the whole area in, of this method, but also sister methods or related methods such as uh, B system, uh, Z system or, or abstract state machine system. I say B formalism, Z formalism, and abstract state machines formalism. Okay, so <clears throat> I will say enough introduction. 
So let me then to go to machines themselves, what they are. Okay, so as you could imagine, with such a broader aims, perhaps over the years, there was a many variants of these machines already been proposed. But the basic version is essentially remains the same as it was proposed in the Lippery guide, say 20 years ago or so. So, so what this basic machine does, it captures the case when we have a single agent uh, which execute uh, the rules, a single agent which actually perform computations. Uh, but also despite a single agent, there is a feature of the whole method that you can naturally model uh, parallel actions. Uh, well, it has some pro and contra, uh, but uh, it kind of uh, at the level of semantics, a precise meaning what's going on in these models, you can easily express uh, parallel updates. So basically you can run the rules which run over all elements of, 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 of the structure. Say update the coloring of a graph for all vertices. So it would be just uh, one rule in, in the model. Uh, so it, it was actually assumes somewhat parallel execution behind the scene. Uh, but this is a put aside, of course, uh, other uh, versions of parallelism or, or distributed computing has also been uh, uh, captured, uh, but uh, in, in, at, at the appropriate level in, in more developed models proposed uh, later. But if, even in the basic models, there is this mm, un, un, underlying parallelism. Now, what are the uh, abstract states? As already uh, mentioned in my very short introduction, these are first order structures, a set of elements with functions and predicates. Okay, so what's the predicates? Predicate is, uh, you can see it also from functional perspective, is a function which given an input return true or false. So in a way, predicates can be also modeled by functions, uh, and vice versa, by the way, if, if you have any function, you can always convert it in some form of predicate if you need to for modeling purposes, because uh, you can always consider a graph of a function as a predicate. So effectively saying with a given, uh, the first n elements would, would represent an input, yet another element would represent the output of the function and then predicate will be true on this n plus one elements, if and only if this last element is the result of application of function of first n elements. So you can, from logical perspective, you can model it in, in both directions, uh, but abstract state machines take, uh, take the perspective that uh, you see on everything as a functions. So if you really have a predicate, if you really have some conditions to check true or false, you can consider it indeed as a Boolean valued function in this framework. Uh, another thing is for modeling, I would say non-trivial uh, practical uh, situations or not trivial systems, it would be very good to have a partial functions. A partial, it means uh, the function may, not be defined or may return nothing sensible on some inputs. Uh, and uh, why it's important to mention here, because here the, the attempt is made to model everything in logical terms. And in a standard logic, the functions are kind of defined everywhere. So if you can see the first of the uh, structures and you have a function in there, uh, it is just a matter of, uh, long conventions and functions are total. Now, if you would like to deal with the functions which might be undefined or uh, at some elements, you, well, you, you have to represent it somehow. So formally, it it's, can be dealt in, in a very uh, simple way. You just assume that your uh, set of elements contain a special element called undef. So if, if you have a function which you would like to model and you would like to model effects that it's not defined on some inputs, or doesn't return anything. Within this model, you can model it as a, it, it returns this element undef. Then from logical perspective, you, you remain uh, safe. 
everything is everywhere defined, but undef just indicates the fact that in, in real life or in the model of reality, this function is, is not defined. Well, another thing is because this functional perspective on, on, on the states, uh, we also always assume that there is a true and false among the elements of these states. So you, you can always model a predicate if you need to. Uh, uh, so so that, that, that is effectively it. So to, to sum it up, so abstract state is a set with partial function of them and predicate and model it as Boolean valued functions. And just one example I, I, I already mentioned, the graphs are the set of vertices uh, with the binary function. Uh, what is a binary function? Uh, uh, which on this set, uh, it means a given two vertices is returned true. If there is a uh, age in there, you would like to model in this graph. So you would like to represent this graph and it return false if there is no age. So that kind of very simple, uh, uh, very simple agreement. But of course, in here, you can all, again, just to uh, illustrate the flexibility of, of approach that graphs, uh, is, of course, it's very simple structure. You can have a hypergraphs if you wish, when you introduce uh, not binary functions, but multi, uh, um, the functions of, of larger arity, or you can introduce colored graphs when you have binary functions plus unary function, which assign the color to vertices uh, and such alike. And, and effectively, because these states are going to be uh, transformed by the execution of machine, we can easily describe transformation of graph or evolution of graphs, uh, uh, as well as adding new elements and retracting elements from the graph. So everything is possible and that give a huge flexibility of, of the whole method. Okay, so now this is about states, but well, possibly enough, uh, uh, enough about states, but what else we need to, uh, to specify in order to have an abstract state machine? Well, you need to specify a, a signature. A signature that basically to say, if you like, de declare the functions which will be there and declare domains. Uh, domains uh, can be seen as uh, just a set of elements. And in principle, you can have different domains. So from logical perspective, you can see the multi-sorted logic. From a if you like, practical modeling perspective, you consider that you have some elements of different nature of different sort or different types. So you can have an elements to serve as the nodes of the graph. You can, serve, you can have some elements which would serve as the colors of the graph and you can serve whichever domains you need, you, 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 you can uh, designate a separate category, declare it and then use in, in, in your machine execution. Now we can also declare initial states here uh, as usual, well, each, Computation should start for something. So this also has to be specified and you have to specify transition rules. And you also have to specify a, a main rule of a program. If you like, it's a main transition rule, which effectively saying how the machine executes everything. Now, it's, if it's not clear at the moment, I, I will explain it shortly how, how, how everything it works, but perhaps, uh, uh, well, especially main rule of a program, if you like the entry point of your program, analog with, say, with, 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 with software, you like this program, you have a main, uh, it should be main function somewhere. It's main which shows how, how everything is being updated, uh, uh, by, by, which actually start a process of, of updating, perhaps using some other uh, uh, transition rules. Okay, now I already said uh, uh, a few words about domain. Uh, I already said there might be more than one domain, could be some sorts and some types. Uh, but now I would like to discuss also extremely important thing about functions. It seems the functions, it's a very generic concept. What, what important we can say about them. Now, because the aim here to, to have a very faithful modeling 
computational phenomena, uh, it's turned out you would need the different types of functions. Uh, some of the functions would be static. It means they would encode just uh, this part of the state or this part of the structure, which will not change over time. Uh, for example, again, referring to my uh, running example of graphs, which are updated over time, uh, you may have a situation when you would like to have a static graphs. So actual structure of the graph will not be changed. Uh, and then you would declare the function which models this graph as a static, and that would ensure that in your uh, modeling, in your simulations, indeed the graph would remain the same. On the other hand, in order to, to do computations, you need to change something and you change it by encoding it as dynamic functions. And dynamic functions, of course, uh, well, in, in this uh, formalism, uh, further uh, categorized by different categories, depending on who is allowed to change it. Uh, so, how, how it might be different sources of, this, uh, of these changes. Uh, this is made uh, for the purpose to distinguish between updates of a structure of, of our state done by the computation itself. So you see our algorithm updating some values of some variables or updating connections with remote host. And this is done from inside of, of the computation or it might be updated by the environment. Environment, it's something uh, from that modeling perspective, it's something you can see effects. If you like, you can see some inputs, but you have no power to change it. It changes by somebody else outside of, of your model. It's also a very, 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 uh, uh, very natural concept when we are talking about modeling. Imagine you model a web server and web server, uh, in principle, there is a lot of information in there, a lot of structure, and, and you need to take care about keeping different things. And one of, of them would be, say, uh, IP addresses to which now connection happens to this web server. And IP addresses may come from arbitrarily uh, uh, directions from arbitrarily uh, sources. There is no way web server itself can control this, this thing. So in order to model this type of uh, information, uh, the monitored functions are, are needed. Monitored, it means the machine itself can read these things, but they cannot be updated by the rules of the machine. Machine can only change controlled functions. Again, functions here understood from the modeling perspective. And I would say, uh, it what may be somewhat unfortunate, the functions may interfere with understanding of functions, say in, in software development in programming in general. So I would notice the functions here understood slightly differently. Functions are the things which model your structure, your state. Uh, well, like graph model by these binary functions uh, uh, denoting the ages of the graph. Uh, and final category on these dynamic things is that you have it shared between, if you like, computation itself and its environment. Uh, it's also very natural. Of course, somehow you can manage to model everything without this shared, in, in fact. But shared are convenient uh, to make something much shorter and much more natural. For example, imagine you are modeling a system again with some network connections, and uh, you would like to uh, to have a part of the state responsible, say, on arrived messages somewhere. So environment would be controlled by putting messages into your your box, uh, for example. But computation uh, for, from by machine itself would would be responsible. Uh, for reading these messages, but also updating the status of, of the box. So some kind of box can be updated both by environment and by, uh, by internal uh, computations. And that indeed very convenient for modeling communication things between 
model and environment or between two such models running like in distributed uh, uh, machines, which I will mention uh, later and so on and so forth. So shared is, is important is important concept uh, and important convenience here. And final category of the functions, which somehow not necessarily this disjoint from other types is just derived functions and derived, if you like, is a convenient definitions you would like to have. So they're not functions which represent kind of core structure of the state. These are the functions which encode some conditions, for example, you would like to check and conditions for which you know how, how to encode it. For example, in a graph, I would like to check that, I don't know, some vertices, some vertex has some neighbors color it in specific colors. How do I do that? I, I would introduce derived function. I would describe how to check this condition. And that would be a function basically uh, not necessarily controlled, not necessarily monitored, not necessarily fitting in one of these categories. It's just a different category. It's just a meta, if you like, syntactical sugar. How you actually check something. Uh, uh, so instead of writing all the time long conditions, you would rather uh, write a simple condition uh, expressed in terms of derived function. Okay, so I hope uh, at least I was not uh, very uh, uh, boring discussing all that. So now let's have a look at some um, transition rules, uh, uh, how they can be, what, what are they in, in abstract state machines, what you can do with these rules uh, and so on and so forth. And so, okay, so let me start. Well, there is a skip rule is a kind of formality which does nothing. And in fact, uh, sometimes I, I wondering myself why, why one would need these rules, but nevertheless, officially, is in there. Uh, if you would like not to do any changes to, to your abstract state, you can run skip rule and, and that's it. Major point is, is update rule. Update rule, if you like, it's analog of uh, assignments in a, say imperative programming languages. And what does it, does it do? It's uh, reassign, so update some value of some function uh, on, on some input. Uh, again, so the main purpose of these updates, of course, to, to change your state. Again, just referring to this running example of a graph, possibly with color it vertices. One of the updates rules may be just to change a color of specific vertex. So you would then to put uh, here as the arguments, you would put a, a vertices uh, you would like to update and then you and then you, you change the value of the function. For example, if this indeed function which models the graph, the update can change some value from true to false, and by this means to remove an H from a graph, or vice versa, to add the H to the graph. But of course, it's just a simple example. Of course, you may have much more complicated structures and do much more complicated updates. But the point is, uh, updates are referring to some locations in this described structure. You're basically saying in this place, you change this function value from that to that. That is all, all uh, possible uh, always to have a rule in machines. Now you have a parallel composition. Parallel meanings just to uh, run these rules simultaneously all together, do updates uh, whichever, uh, uh, when, whenever possible. Uh, despite simplicity, that brings some uh, non-trivial uh, questions here, which I just hint on it, but possibly will not discuss in many details. So what possible problems with the parallel updates is that uh, they may contradict to each other, to, to say it shortly. It means, imagine you have X, which update the color of some vertices to green, one why why update the color of the same vertex to red? So how then would you run this parallel composition of some updates which may contradict to each other? A common uh, agreement here then in this case the machine just breaks. 
or stops. And because if, if you are in a situation when there is a possible uh, updates, then, uh, and no rules more applicable. So if rules contradict to each other, then everything breaks. And of course, as a side remark, it means uh, despite maybe clarity of the theoretical model that can easily introduce uh, some uh, undecidability. Uh, because in general, if, if you have enough structure in your, uh, in your program, you can easily mod model here universal computation. And then it, it may mean that you might not be able to detect such cases uh, in advance. And it might mean that indeed some, some programs, or in this case, some models may be broken uh, suddenly, unexpectedly, and there is no way to put, uh, to put it uh, easy, easy conditions here to, to avoid such situations. But again, it's, it's a, one of the consequences of the universality of modeling formalism. If you would like to model everything possible, then of course you, you, would, you would hit such situations. So, but nevertheless, if, if you do careful design of the rules, that may be avoided, kind of contradictory updates, and so you can then run them in, in parallel and uh, uh, run and try them to, uh, uh, to update uh, whenever possible. Now you have also sequential composition, you have conditional rules, if phi is an X and Y, you have, oh, sorry, let rule, let which allow you to allocate some value to uh, uh, some function A, and then execute, uh, execute the X. The X may, may refer to A, of course, as usual in such situations. And then again, it gives you a, a nice syntactical uh, sugar, how, how to write these things. Now, a few more, a few more, <clears throat> Uh, not entirely trivial uh, uh, rules we have here. One is a uh, universal rule. As, as you see, it, it comes indeed from, from logic, if you like. But in, uh, in modeling, it gives you opportunity to write shortly. So basically execute the rule for all uh, possible uh, uh, locations or for all possible places, if you like, in the structure you are modeling. Uh, as an analog would be, you can execute a rule on, on a graph and recolor all vertices from red to green by just application of one such a rule. Okay, this rule, if uh, of course you have you have to uh, so in, in this case, psi is some condition on a. You you can say specify this condition and then in this way. You can write a rule, for example, updates on Vesuvius vertices of graph, which have a degree two, only two neighbors, and leave all others uh, untouched. Uh, yet another, I would say, very powerful modeling tool, uh, but uh, maybe not that straightforward for uh, direct implementation is a, a non-deterministic choice, or if you like, existential quantifier. It means what what kind of computation you can model here? I choose some elements of the domain uh, such that it satisfies some property psi and then do some actions X. Then X could be one of the rules of the types we have seen before. If none of such A exists, then execute something different. So uh, it's also uh, powerful modeling tool, which allow you to concisely to describe some kind of non-deterministic choice, but also to describe natural non-determinism uh, in the systems. Uh, for example, it, it might be a system which has a several nodes of execution. And uh, there is a kind of underlying non-determinism. We don't know which node may take some action at which point. Uh, and then in order to model it, you can use this choose uh, uh, operator that basically it's saying, okay, pick one of the uh, uh, elements of, of, of the structure, pick one of the nodes, pick one of the agents and uh, do something. Uh, of course, kind of, 
we are talking here about modeling. It's not necessarily uh, straightforward to have it as an implementation, uh, uh, but for, for, for the modeling, non-determinism non is, is quite useful. And finally, call rule is something to, uh, to make, a, uh, make a call to a specific rule R, or by, by the way, I, I just missed the name of the rule R here. Uh, so it should be R in front of, of the first bracket. So basically it means when you specified some, some rule somewhere, uh, in, in some part of your, of your uh, uh, specification, you can actually call it, say, within uh, other rules and, and execute it. Well, again, usual, this is analog of, of say, functions in, in a, you know, say, in, 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 in functional programming languages or, or imperative programming languages or functions or methods when you specify it in one place and call it in another place. It's also possible is the basic model of abstract state machines. Now, so that concludes somehow, if you like, official introduction to the basic machines. That's what you can do with the structures. And, uh, but remember, of course, you may think about it. Well, as I thought when I first seen this formalism, okay, so why else, why again, I need something like, you know, we have seen probably uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of different languages, which kind of either programming languages or modeling languages, which doing something similar. Again, we have some compositions and so on and so forth. Well, the point here is that to have a very firm semantics based on a very clear and rigorous understanding what the structures are, how they are updated, so semantics. And secondly, uh, it, it, this modeling gives you a freedom to choose your uh, uh, modeling elements, your vocabulary. And that is, uh, instead of now going to abstract discussion, I would like just to demonstrate uh, an example. And vocabulary or signature, which is uh, one of the components of uh, ISM, as I, I, I declared, is something which, if you like, declaration part of the model. In the declaration part, you would say which domains you would have, which monitored function, controlled function, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, so this is a declaration. And then you, you would specify the rules. But first, about this example. So this example is, in fact, uh, came, uh, I borrowed it from a, a, a PhD thesis of a former PhD student here at University of Liverpool, Farah Al-Sharifi who has done her project on, under my supervision uh, a couple of years ago, she completed, and she modeled this system, which originally it's, it's called uh, train, sorry, uh, I'm just train door controller, right? <laughs> train door controller, which she herself borrowed from yet another paper by other authors, and precise reference could be found in, in, in her thesis, which were introduced for illustration of um, hazard analysis problems. Uh, so Farah actually reformulated in abstract state machine terms. And I found that this is a very nice illustrative example, which would somehow give a feeling what is what in all this uh, abstract setup of these machines. So we are talking about some train controllers and we are talking about that train controllers uh, uh, would have some status. We would like to distinguish between different activities which going on when train controllers are executed, but by sensing or executing. Uh, we have different statuses of the doors of the train. So the idea is we model situation where the train arrive, arrive on the station, uh, could be aligned or not aligned with the platform. That's important thing. It shouldn't open the doors before the position status is aligned. It could be close the door. Uh, so it should, shouldn't open this. So we have a door status. Again, so from formal modeling, you, you have just uh, this domain of, if you like, values for a door status. 
position status is just two elements aligned, not aligned. Motion status, we are at this level of abstraction, we are interested only in two facts, to acknowledging of two facts, whether the train is moving or whether the train is stopped. Well, availability, well, this is somewhat questionable choice of modeling, but nevertheless, availability is either exist or not exist, probably could be expressed slightly different, but nevertheless, so this is the values which would indicate existence or not existence of emergency situation or some obstacles, uh, uh, tra uh, train uh, first emergency situation, but then also obstacles uh, train may have, I mean, obstacles for doors to be closed. For example, if a passenger still within within a door, so it shouldn't uh, shouldn't uh, close. So we need somehow to acknowledge the fact, and it would be acknowledged by availability of uh, some event or uh, availability or occurrence. Maybe would be a better term. But nevertheless, let's let's remain availability. Now, in order to model situation of the train, you would also have monitored function. Monitored function is. So from a perspective of the uh, uh, train controller, uh, so you would have a sensor which would return a motion status. So basically controller should know whether we are stopped now or we are moving, moving now. That means you have a monitored function because uh, uh, this is information controller would receive from the environment. Uh, it has also emergency sensor. It means it would receive information about uh, uh, whether emergency present or not present. You see, so again, it has this uh, function which return a value in the availability domain. So this is monitored function. So basically controller looks on the environment, but also it has a controlled function in which you can, uh, uh, you you can have different values for door status. A controlled function, it means controller itself may change the value, may update them, these statuses. Door status, train motion, may uh, start or, or stop train. Uh, train position may uh, update the train position and may update also uh, emergency status and obstacle status. Uh, notice that there is some duality here. Emergency sensor is something which comes from the environment. An obstacle sensor, again, the function which could be updated only by environment. But for control function, we also have uh, their analogs. But this is, a, for, from a perspective, effectively, if you like, a local variables or local functions. So you receive some signals from environment, but then you, you have to deal it inside of your controller system. So from that perspective, you, you may wish also to, to, to have these functions to update their values according. Uh, so basically to keep track uh, of information returned by these sensors or by, by these monitored or uh, external functions. We also have a general state of the controller, which is of, of, uh, of domain of status. And we have also derived functions. So here's a perhaps uh, a good, good point to explain what derived function could be. So we have a condition uh, basically saying uh, safe situation is So when we detect a safe situation is by definition, if one of these values is returned by the door status. So safe situation when the door is opened or opening. Uh, so basic assumption here that unsafe situation is that the doors are not open and opening and the passengers, for example, cannot be evacuated from, from, the, from the train. So now safe situation when the door is one of the statuses and it means, uh, so you see uh, this function is not updated neither by environment nor by controller, 
but it's rather defined or if okay defined or that's why it's called derived function so basically you can evaluate this function on on, on any state but it's not uh, uh not the function which being updated for the modeling of the state purposes so if you like it's a is an, just an extension of the basic uh, structure by definitions. Okay, so what's the, now the main rule for the door controller? And uh, the main rule here, it's almost following some word description. And uh, that's also give you a, a hint on how the abstract state machines can be used as to get a high level model, which capture essential aspects at the same time preserving some uh, formality or actually being totally formal. And that's, that's a case, case, I feel like main advantage of, of abstract state machines uh, to be used uh, uh, in general. So, so what's the main function of the train controller? So you, you see there are some conditionals here. So if you have uh, a state sensing, then we try to execute the following rules in, in parallel. So again, the parallel composition is often just omitted. So once you see just a list of, of, of the functions here, a list of the rules, it means that they all trying to be executed in, in parallel. Uh, so, uh, so basically mean in, in, in sensing state, you are doing emergency sensing just to figure out whether indeed there is an issue or not. We, we, we have, we are doing train motion sensing again to see if there is a, any problems over there. You do obstacle sensing, you set up your state to uh, executing. So you see, so implicitly what happens here, you have a switching between sensing and executing steps. So effectively, you sense uh, if if everything is is okay, then the next round of execution you would go for executing a, a command. Uh, you would also set up emergency uh, as doesn't exist. Uh, now you you just keep this value, but if emergency occurring equals to exist then you call the rules to handle emergency. Uh, but also you try to execute all, all different rules, which essentially uh, means uh, to, to follow the workflow of the train. So if the, if the door was closed, you try to execute to be opening. If it was opening, so eventually it goes to state opened, open to closing and so on and so forth. But in this page, you see only, if you like, uh, the names of these rules. And uh, I, I will just represent probably a couple of these, just what is inside. But you see here from the high level perspective, there is a large loop of actions, sensing, executing, uh, checking some conditions based on, on these checks. There are some other rules executing uh, or some other rules executing. Uh, Again, perhaps you can see kind of a lot of details, a lot of things in parallel, but also this parallel composition plays a, a good, good role here. That in a way, uh, effectively, uh, uh, from a modeling perspective, it's also quite natural. So you bring together all activities which could be done, uh, uh, which could be done for, which can be done or should be done for the uh, uh, train controller, and you try to execute them in parallel. And then the semantic X is, of course, whether you can execute each of these actions depends on the status not only, uh, not only uh, of the controlled functions, but also on the status of returned or monitored functions. So some of these rules may be not executing, but which are, we, these rules which are enabled will be executed and so, so forth to support uh, 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 the whole execution process. And now let me just show some of the internals of the rules mentioned here, not all of the rules, but some of them. 
So emergency sensing, it means just very simple thing. You just uh, update your local controllable functions by values returned by monitored function. So now this emergency is available uh, uh, for, for the records or for, for further checks. So emergency sensing, you, you just read the value from the outside. Handle emergency is that if, if you have not a safe situation, if it's detected during execution, then door status has to be changed to open. Uh, so that's the idea. If, if, if there is no safe situation, then, uh, and if, if emergency needs to be executed, then door has to be opened. So that is uh, uh, effectively reflect, feel like formally reflect a very good intuition. If, if there is some emergency, o open all doors and allow the passenger to evacuate. And close to opening, it means, uh, well, conditions and which door status may be turned to opening. Well, it, these conditions have to be satisfied, which are natural conditions, closed, train should be stopped, and train position should be aligned with the platform. If some of these are not satisfied, then the door status will not be opening. Right, of course, <laughs> Uh, one may think, so why talking about such trivial things? Well, relatively trivial. These are quite natural uh, rules, but that's exactly the point in, in a way. So you have this high level word description, how the controller should operate. And now you converted it into the precise rules, again, which operate in the abstract way. In abstract way, it means at this level, we don't care at all how the train is stopped, how the sensor is working, how the door status opening is achieved. So these mechanisms, which kind of in real life has to be present just outside of this level of abstraction. At this level of abstraction, we have modeled dynamic of all essential features, not losing formality of the model which exactly I would say is the main advantage of the abstract state machines. Now, if you would like to bring something um, more details, you can then refine the model and define in more details, for example, uh, uh, how the door status is changing or how is actual uh, uh, train is stopped. A train is stopped maybe just uh, to say, engage the brakes. It's yet another activity, which is not present in here, but if you would like to model at finer granularity, you could introduce this concept in here. Again, extend appropriate way the vocabulary, uh, uh, extend the rules, which would show in which moment of time the break has to be applied. And then you get a different, more refined model. That's exactly illustration to the power of, of, of the method, but also illustration of different categories of of functions in use, uh, both controllable, but also external or monitored functions. Now, so far so good, but one of the questions which may be asked by somebody who looks at all that, um, a part of it, it's, it's all trivial, uh, it might be a question, stop, why do you need any new formalism if everything we see here can be modeled more or less straightforward by some you know, finite state formalisms. So like either in propositional logic or in some input language of some model checker or, uh, or something like that. So effectively what we see here and this specification, so we have this domains, we have these functions, it's finite state after all. And when it's a finite state, so basically maybe it's not that important uh, that you have these fancy names. Maybe then you, you just create finite state automaton and do whatever you want with them. Well, to the extent it's true, to the, yeah, so that's uh, obviously what we see here in data kind of finite state system. It may be modeled in a way kind of more natural than you would like to do some kind of abstract finite states 
probably you would have an explosion of these states. And uh, so here, if you like, you have more compact representation of this finite state. But nevertheless, is the finite states is the restrictions of uh, uh, abstract state machines? The answer is no. And here's just one example. Uh, how kind of unbounded states can be modeled or can be introduced and dealt with with the model. And here I take it one example from actually one of our papers, which I will refer to by the end of this talk, uh, which allow you, so what's going on here? So what is the update rule here? So we have obviously dealing with encryption and encryption, uh, well, uh, as you perhaps uh, know, uh, so it's a process which take uh, some message, which take some key and make it something unreadable out of this message, so encryption. So this can be modeled almost literally within ISM formalism, like this function encrypt, which take a message, which take a, a, a private key. In this case, it even comes from public key, if you like public key cryptography. Oh, no, if you have rather public key, PK is a public key, you have a public key, and here it's a reference to whose this public key is. So there is an additional argument. It could be different uh, identities in there. So if you have identity, you have a function which return a public key of this identity, and then you apply encryption function to get some message as a result. But now in this case, you see nested function which apply encryption twice, which always possible. If you are talking about cryptographic protocols, you, you can do many such things. But you see, if you have this, this rule, you update a message. So a message, it can be seen as a function which keeps a value, uh, which keeps some value, right? So if you have a message uh, on the right, you perform an encryption, you perform encryption again, you update the message with the result of this. Now you can apply this rule again. It would again encrypt again and again. So effectively what you get here, even on abstract level, abstracting away from the details of encryption, just accounting, say how many layers of encryption you will get, there is no bounds. When you apply these rules, you may, it may grow indefinitely. And in this way, in these abstract state machines, you can model not necessarily finite state computations, but you can model infinitely growing computations uh, yes, well this is a just one situation another situation i already mentioned with say graphs you can model aspects like adding new vertices to the graph and uh, removing vertices for the graph and uh, again in, in principle there are no upper bound on that so you can model again this is an important thing you can model infinite systems or infinite state systems or unbounded systems. Of course, it comes for the cost. That's also uh, uh, a good point to make, a kind of conceptual point. You have much more expressive modeling power as compared, say, with standard finite state machines. You cannot model this in an indefinite uh, number of encryptions applied, for example. But of course, it, it comes for the expense at the expense of verifiability. Uh, of course, you can create such a formal model in which you allow for indefinite growth for encryption. But then how do you verify? Uh, you can apply different methods, but generally, of course, for such infinite state systems, there are no uh, uh, guarantee. In general, problem is undecidable, of course, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So there is a always trade-off here, but abstract state machines give you opportunity to choose at which level you model systems. If you like to model unbounded states, it'd be perfectly fine. You can just uh, do it by the rules like that, but in these specific scenarios. And more example of this uh, can be seen in specification validation of cryptographic protocols, in, say in, in one of our papers. We're not claiming that the only paper is dealing with this is just uh, there are many uh, other uh, papers on that, but we just done it recently. And it's turned out, if you would like to have a proper model of say cryptographic protocols, it's somewhat inevitable to go outside of finite state machines. 
uh, in order to get a kind of delicate modeling of this kind of repeated encryption or repeated recombination of messages in which you can uh, decrypt something, then recombine these messages. If there are uh, no restrictions on the number of this, this would be better modeling of real situations. Because say for an attacker on, on a cryptographic protocol, we don't know in advance what kind of restrictions he or she may have. So from this perspective, it's good for modeling, but again, it may affect verifiability or in general uh, uh, ability to analyze this. Okay, so this is a good point about abstract state machines. Uh, well, so far so good, it was a single agent abstract state machine is just one location in which all computations may, may go. And of course, it's very limited. And of course, it's been recognized very early and uh, appropriate extension is uh, distributed abstract state machines, which effectively it means you have a finite state of agents in each of these in, in executes its own basic ASM. But what is more, this set of agents can be also dynamic. So you have a special uh, uh, domain of agents and they can be brought in or uh, taken out. So in general, these models give you a very uh, flexible way of modeling in this proper multi-agent or distributed computations. I would here also notice that even before introducing of these models, basic model itself can be used to model uh, uh, distributed computations. Say if our structure itself may represent uh, say graph and nodes, each nodes may have some agent sitting there, may operate some rules, but this way of looking is much more natural. So you acknowledge that indeed, you acknowledge explicitly at the level of model itself. So there are several lines of executions and you provide the rules for, for this for these updates. And again, this is very useful for, again, I already mentioned this cryptographic protocols. It's something almost inevitable there because in, in the protocols uh, you have a different parties and each have their, their own agenda and they're executing their own rules and they may perform some non-deterministic actions. So in order to understand what's going on, you, you really need to use it multi-agent multi modeling. And that is perfectly, perfectly all right with a, a, a framework of abstract state machines. Now, uh, now returning to <clears throat> software development. Well, after all, uh, this school is on software development and probably so far it was a, a little bit uh, abstract, even though modeling it's well recognized as important part of the, of the software development. And specifically here, I, I would like to refer to a very deep, at the same time, very simple conceptual model, which called ground model, uh, which is of direct relevance to software development. Uh, for example, if, if you face a development of some real world system or real world uh, it's software for some real world system. And you would like to, to have some requirements for that. Well, of course, this is a subject of requirement analysis, but abstract state machine perspective provide you a perspective. Uh, well, let's create a ground model. So what is a ground model? It's very abstract sense. Ground model is some form of model which model exactly all relevant aspects of, of a system we would like to have. So we may have informal requirements, so, but ground formal, ground model should have a precision. So we, we would like to have a model which would say precisely what is, uh, what is what we would like to have eventually as a result of say software development or general system development. It also would be good to have it as, simple and concise. The model should contain all relevant aspects and all unrelevant or at the wrong level of abstraction, so it's too technical, should be abstracted away. For example, if you implement a system which use network connections and probably 
it would be not very good idea to have this uh, very detailed description how the connection happens on the low level of the network protocols. You would rather would have it on a conceptual level to see which parties are involved, what kind of actions happening. Similar like it was an example for train controller. So you see train controller set in high, high level terms, what, what is going on in the system, what we would like to have eventually. So that I'm referring also to abstractness model is good, would good to, to be abstract and consistent. And consistency, it's it's very nice uh, point here because I would say this is the only way you can get to, to consistency if to go formal. The formal give you somehow ultimate precision. And then if there is some inconsistency, it's uh, the only way to detect it. So I, I would put it like a, inconsistencies or contradictions or uh, such as things are not possible without uh, uh, formality in here. And semantic foundation is also linked to, uh, to abstractness and precision. It means, so eventually ground model should have the kind of very clear ultimate rigorous semantics that everybody would agree when see this model, what is going on here? So there are no uncertainty left. And so one of the arguments which specifically was very clearly put in the book I referred at the beginning by Egan Berger and Alexander Rushke is that abstract state machines is exactly a formalism to build such models. You choose your vocabulary. R remember this uh, train controller. You, you make everything, uh, you make everything precise, but at the required level of abstraction. You don't go early to details of implementation. You just exactly specify what you would like to have here. And that's what, what is called ground model. And I would recommend to this book, especially introductory part, which has a much, much more detailed discussion of all these subtleties, which in modeling of real world phenomena and modeling our intentions or our user requirements, as these uh, uh, abstract state machines models. But I hope this example with train controller uh, just give a flavor what is meant here. But of course, once you have such a model, you can go for stepwise refinement. And refinement, it means once you have one model, you, you can have more detailed model, but which would implement something we, we just named on a high level. You would implement, for example, as I, as I mentioned, a train uh, stopping uh, implementation would be kind of uh, engage the brakes. Of course, uh, you can introduce the brakes explicitly and then create a model and then you can refine it further. The brakes could be different. Uh, it could be engaged in different ways. You can introduce more arguments, more parameters in there. And that's what is called stepwise refinement. And what is important here to, to keep correctness. And because you have a formal model on each step, you have also a chance to apply a rigorous reasoning here, be it automated or be it just a, a human reasoning, just to show that indeed this lower level models, refined models uh, support all the desired properties of the ground model. So you hit this delicate step from informal requirements to exactly formal reasoning which then eventually would ensure correctness of whatever is being implemented. And that's uh, to put it in a more uh, precise way, uh, you, you would facilitate effectively removal of, of ambiguities and eventually creating a correct system. And again, the claim, particularly from this book, I already mentioned that ASM is a good formalism to do such a stepwise refinement. Now, a few words about uh, implementations. So it's very good to, to say in general what's in there, how it could be applied. And there has been many implementations of ASM methods, at, at least I would say a dozens, different research prototypes, a bit more serious systems, uh, closer to industrial applications. Uh, I won't mention all of them here. I would mention only two, which in my opinion, that is of course a somewhat biased perspective, but Nevertheless, the core ASM is open source project. It's available in there. You, you, you can go and see and take a part and use the system. And ISM Meta, it's another system. And that is a system which we are 
here at Liverpool have actually used for, for, for several works and we try it. And uh, that's why I will say a little bit more details about these systems. It's not a recognition of the fact that core SM is anything worse. It's just, uh, just uh, we know more about this system. We just used it more. So ISM meta, so what it is. So this is a system which was proposed by Elvinia Rikobene and her uh, collaborators and so authors in starting 15, 17 years ago. And it's this framework for abstract state machines and there are several tools and it's fully available, free for use. You can go there, you download, you can start playing with these models. It's include the editor, a simulator, and validator, model checker, and validator. Well, okay, so how is different say from model checker? A validator is something which allow you to do a symbolic testing. It's allow you to run the models, uh, uh, symbolic, but just execute the models. And whenever you hit, for example, a monitored function, which require input from a uh, from environment, you can have different choices. Either user may serve as environment, in enter some number or enter some input, or you may have some random model of environment, or you have separate model as a model for environment in which you then bring the values, but it's allow you to, to do multiple runs using a scripting language available there and then do a testing. A nice, as, one nice feature as compared with uh, standard testing, here you do it with the uh, abstract models. So for example, you can do it with the model of the train, uh, train controller. You don't need to provide implementation of all this. You just directly execute the rules and you see how the change, how the state is changed. But what is more, there are some further translators to the, uh, there is a model checker in some cases, you can actually, if indeed there is a finite state behind the scene, you can actually translate it into the uh, model checker uh, in input language and model check with a new SMV model checker. And more recent uh, developments is a translator to uh, uh, satisfiability model theory uh, uh, solvers and also code generation for C++. So you can have abstract model but then you press the button and generate C++ code with alleged functionality. Of course, this, these things have their own limitations, syntactical. It's, of course, not everything is, 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 is possible, but specifically for model checker, you need to ensure somehow a finite state model, while in general rules may generate infinite states. And here is an interesting, I would say, theoretical challenge how you delineate uh, this, uh, these both sides in here. And finally, uh, I'm just arriving. I hope I, I provided enough, uh, uh, well, I, I introduced enough to, to you to be interested, at least some of you to be interested in this method. And I just to say a little bit about uh, research here at Liverpool, we have done mostly within a project, PhD project by Farah Al Sharifi. Now she's at University of Babylon in Iraq. And Claire Dixon, who at the time was at Liverpool, now she is at, at Manchester. So now we have done several works, but all of them illustrate different aspects of application of ASM. And first is about safe system design. So in fact, there are, you know, many approaches to safe system designs and some of them are semi-formal. Semi-formal, it means you just read the handbook and so basically to make your system safe, you, you do that, that, that. There are some recipe how to do it. What we have shown, in fact, you, you can benefit of merging abstract state machine perspective from some of these informal or semi-formal methods. And this is called uh, STPA method. And probably I won't mention, I, I won't discuss it anymore taking into account the time left, but uh, that's what, uh, what, what we have done here. And that is also a very good illustration of overall power of the formalism. A second work, it's also perhaps it's, in my opinion, one of the most important applications of it is clarification of disambiguation of semi-formal specifications. I know fortunately or unfortunately, very many things 
in computing exist in kind of not very, very definite states. For some important protocols or solutions, you have only semi-formal specifications and often it comes in form of RFCs, request for comments only. And in fact, when you try to formalize and try to get to down to the earth, what's in fact in there, it says, you could find out some ambiguity and that's what we have done with uh, security, uh, with simple authentication and security layer by modeling in the abstract state machines. We just done it and then has shown that there are some ambiguity here and there are some choices to be made where and there. So I believe this is a, one of the promising applications just to make semi-formal, uh, not entirely precise specifications precise eventually using abstract state machines. And finally, I, I already mentioned many times uh, this uh, cryptographic protocol analysis, uh, cryptographic protocol validation is yet another work. And uh, yeah, probably it's abstract state machine turned out to be very helpful in uh, uh, modeling different various aspects. For example, property of the environment or behavior of the attacker so attacker, not necessarily abstract attacker, which can do everything. Attacker himself may or herself may have some limitations and that can be properly modeled within abstract state machines. And now I'm arrived to the end of my talk. Uh, so thank you very much for attention. And now uh, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer. Uh, thank you, Alexei. I believe it was very interesting and um, uh, uh, mind uh, enlarging talk, if I may say so. Um, much food for thought for, thought for our uh, listeners. So, are there any questions? You, you can ask them out loud or type in the chat. Um, I, I think Natalia Kushik wants to say something. Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Can you see me? I, I can yes. hear you, but I cannot see you because I'm sharing the screen and so basically my ah. vision is somewhat, somewhat limited. Ah, I see. Well, uh, thank you very much, Alexei, for, for this very interesting talk. It's just that I'm preparing myself for my presentation tomorrow, so I would like to ask a small question. Um, because you mentioned uh, the works of um, the group of Angel, Angelo Gargantini and others that uh, they are having this tool for, um, for using abstract state machines for different reasons, including testing. And um, so I wanted just to know how far do they know they or others have gone when it comes to the testing with the guaranteed fault coverage? Uh, this is a good, good question. Uh, so as far as I Remember, so so how the testing is happening? So they have, well, in, in particular, in this approach, uh, as a meta, they have a validator component, which allow you to write a script in a pre predefined language, which would actually allow you to navigate uh, state space, so to speak. Now. In some cases, I believe it can come with guarantees, especially if you don't have monitored functions. Okay. Now, if you have monitored functions, then there is a question, how do you cover this? Because this is something which environment return to you. Uh, so in, in this case, you either indeed open to the real environment, the user may enter whatever they want, or you can have a separate model for environment, which would returns the value on demand. Now, how does it... Mm, okay. 
Yeah, well, I will. <laughs> so, frankly speaking, I don't remember about any guarantees, uh -huh. but I do remember that you are given kind of full flexibility to write your testing script, very reasonable uh, flexibility in which I think in, in many cases you can reach full coverage at the expense of efficiency, uh, but in some cases it's just not possible. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, well, I, I actually expected a similar play, of course, because of the formalism, which is like that. So it's, it's totally normal. Uh, yeah, got it. Thank you very much. All right, yes, you're very welcome. Uh, there is another question in the chat. Sure. Could you elaborate on the difference between ACM and FCM? All right, ACM and FCM. Okay, yeah, so sorry, probably I didn't tell too much about FCM, but what I mean here is just a jargon referring to, sorry, where did I mention it? All right, uh, uh, jargon basically referring to finite state machines or finite automata. So that is a, a standard, very simple model of finite automata, finite state machines. So you have the states and you have transitions between them. That's all what's in there. Now, and states usually consider it abstract, like a state, you can distinguish between different states, but no structure within a state. Right? There are finitely many states, so there are some transitions. Well, abstract state machines is something which has a state with a structure. So it's not just a state S1, S2, S3, which state itself may be a graph or maybe more complex track colored graph or Petri net. Uh, what, whatever you want, an arbitrary first order uh, structure. Uh, this is the first difference. And second difference is in abstract state machines in basic model, you can model uh, unbounded com computations. So in principle, number of states it may model, or if you like it generate, if you actually execute it, it could be infinite or unbounded. So that's, uh, that's the difference. 